Yeah. Okay. So tell me, tell me, Nico, when to start. Did it change? Is someone something wrong? Is the other screen? Yes, we are not seeing the talk. We are seeing, ah. Ah, now it's okay. Yeah, so now please. it's okay. Yeah, it was this one. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. So uh, let's see if the last speaker shows up at the exactly the right moment, but <laughs> <laughs> otherwise we can start. Okay. So uh, first of all, hi everybody. And let me welcome you to the first gong show of this Young Frontiers meeting. Uh, we shall have hopefully, hopefully uh, five talks, five minutes each. Uh, since there, this means that actually it's a short time for each talk, I would appreciate if the speakers, uh, I would appreciate the speakers to be very respectful of the, of the time timetable, please. And uh, there will be no time for questions during the gong, so please take note of your doubts and reserve them until the discussion session at the end of the, of the meeting today. So the first talk uh, will be given by Felipe Diaz from the from Universidad de Atejo. And the title of the talk is The Citer Entanglement and UV Cutoffs. Okay. So thank you very much to the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. So I will talk a little bit about the CITER entanglement and how UV corrections to the entropy could lead to uh, the understanding of UV cutoff, which is an important problem today in quantum gravity. So if you can please uh, go to the next slide. Okay, so the outline of the talk is I first uh, will give the setup on which geometry will work, then a little bit of entropy and free energy, uh, a little bit of asymptotic symmetry algebra, and how this back reacts into log corrections and in entanglement. Uh, next, please. <laughs> okay, so the CITER as its own is a, a way to study the CITER. It is because our universe might be uh, described by the CITER space time uh, in two different epochs, like in the very early beginnings of the universe or at the very late, due to, uh, according to cosmological data that we have. And this corresponds to the maximally uh, symmetric solution to the vacuum Einstein equations. Um, due to this ex uh, infl uh, exponential inflation, uh, the light rays do not manage to propagate to, to the whole space time. So observers inside the sitter do not have access to the whole uh, region, cannot communicate. So uh, these uh, observant dependence uh, quantities that we were trying to explain can be described by this line element that I'm gonna use. Uh, so if you can please go to the next slide. <laughs> um, uh, the fascinating thing about these uh, observers in the city is the fact that due to this uh, horizon that appears and disconnected regions uh, for the observer, they suffer from the given Hawking effect, which means that they have a temperature, a little bit associated like the Unruh effect, but moreover, they have an entropy. And this entropy, uh, we don't know what, where are the microstates or what degrees of freedom is trying to describe. And it's also an observable dependent. And <laughs> I will try to understand this cosmological horizon entropy that I will refer as given Hawking. So if you can go to the next one. Okay, so one of the big problems of the entropy uh, is that Banks and Fisher, they, they propose using M-theory methods that the, any asymptotically decitor space a quantum gravity on the sitter will have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, which is the exponential of the given Hawking entropy. And this uh, raises a problem in the quantization of intense Hilbert action by means of perturbation theory, because you have to do in terms of um, on terms of power of L over G. But that cannot be due if the dimension of the Hilbert space is a finite number. Uh, so you can go to the next, please. So uh, I cannot give too much detail due to time, but uh, uh, in 20, in year 20, we sent two papers and we show that if you use replicatrix on a decider background using Einstein Hilbert as the semi classical approximation of quantum gravity, uh, the Rennie entropy associated to two patches, two observers, disconnected observers inside the sitter, they are entangled and the Rennie entropy is actually constant and it's twice the given Hawking entropy. 
So this describes a maximally mixed entangled state, and that will give an explanation of uh, the finiteness of Gibbons Hogan entropy. Uh, so if you can go to the next, please. So we use replica tricks in order to do that, which means that we replicate uh, along the entangling surface, generating a branch cover manifold. And then the Rennie entropy can be understood using a relation between Rennie entropy and free energy on this background. And moreover, we also use CFT to describe uh, a certain regions of the space time, and we compute that central charge, which is Q dependent, where Q now is the uh, orbifold parameter. Uh, so next, please. Okay, so we use asymptotic symmetries on the horizon where Carbitt show that there is a CFT associated to the horizon and the central charge actually reproduce the given socket entropy up to a free parameter that can be fixed depending on what you want to do. Uh, so in the next slide, uh, we show that the, if you put this free parameter satisfying the Rennie entropy computation to be the Rennie entropy to be constant as we obtained before, and then you consider quantum corrections to the horizon CFT which is correction, quantum correction, like saddle point approximation, the next to lead in order uh, into the Cardi entropy. You get this, this uh, entropy, which diverges when uh, Q goes to one, which is the original visitor space. Can so the next- around, around one minute. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this is my like almost last. So uh, this Rennie entropy now have a Q dependence. Um, the three important limits is the entanglement limit, which now is uh, di divergent. And the last, uh, when you take Q to zero, that gives you the dimensionality of the, the, uh, the reduced uh, density matrix or the Hilbert space of the reduced density matrix. So this is uh, constant. And the next slide, please. And it's actually the Banks proposal. So the Banks proposal survived even when you, when you consider the first quantum corrections to the horizon entropy. And moreover, the entanglement entropy now acquires a UV divergent term, which is how uh, universal uh, UV uh, entanglement to be should behave. So I think I will stop here due to time. Uh, sorry for if I rush. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Felipe. Our you. next speaker is uh, Lucas Asito from Instituto de Física de la Plata. And the title of the talk is Super Radiant Black Hole Rockets. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Lucas, and we are going to see how it is possible to use the super process on black holes to build a rocket. Next, please. Uh, full test, full slide, thank you. Uh, no. Uh, well, uh, first, what is super -ions? Well, uh, it can be simply summarized as a process where the reflective radiation due to the system is enhanced uh, with respect to the incident radiation. Uh, the first encounter in physics that we have with this uh, radiation amplification process is the so-called claim paradox. Uh, and it is now super to occur in on black holes. Uh, recently, it has been, it study has been growing. Uh, it has many applications in several areas. So how it works, uh, super on black hole. Well, first we need um, a black hole such that it is possible super to occur. Uh, that there is a back reaction when a particle falling into the black hole. Uh, this means that uh, super ions doesn't happen on Schwarzschild black hole, and in particular, we're interested in charged black hole. So uh, let's think on a particle falling into a, a, this kind of black hole. Then we will have an incident uh, wave with a group velocity uh, that enters into uh, the black hole. This means that the information of the particle is lost uh, due to the, it enters into the black hole. But uh, if the separation condition is fulfilled, there is a phase velocity that is opposite to the group velocity. Uh, this means that there is energy ca coming out from the black hole. Uh, in the case of charged black hole, uh, the separation condition is that the frequency of the particle is less than the electric energy of generated by the black hole at the horizon. Uh, so to sum up, uh, super ions is a process of energy extraction of a black hole. Then can, we can ask, uh, can this energy be used? Next, please. So one answer is the uh, black hole bomb, where uh, uh, a black hole is surrounded by a perfect uh, mirror, a spherical mirror, uh, where the energy coming out from the black hole due to super ions, it is reflected. 
this uh, configuration is unstable since uh, any superion mode will lead to a, a exponential growth of the dens energy density and pressure in so inside the, the mirror. Uh, then uh, it will collapse, um, giving rise to the main black hole bomb. Uh, the, the instability, uh, it means that the imaginary part of the frequency became positive, as it can be seen in the work of the Vashon Erdair. So, Starting with this motivation, we wonder what will happen if we uh, have an open geometry, uh, such as the picture below, um, where in particular we consider a, a, a charged flat hole surrounded by an spherical perfect mirror in a thermal bath of the scalar uh, charged particle and antiparticle. Then we have uh, a thrust force in this configuration, uh, giving rise to the name of what we call superion black hole rocket. Uh, next, please. Uh, here, I am only, only going to show how it works for an incident uh, plane wave uh, at a fixed angle. Uh, to do so, we solve the clean gordon equation, minimal capital with the gauge field at a curved space given by the Franklin nostrum metric. Uh, the general solution is uh, that, that series uh, where we have, when we separate variables, and the radial part we obtain numerically by imposing the boundary condition well, that we have on the black hole and infinity. And then we match uh, paste these two pieces of the field and by imposing the boundary condition at the mirror. In the two graphs below, uh, I show how this work uh, from uh, fixed uh, energy and uh, incident angle. Uh, and well, it, it, these are very recent results. Uh, and there's this plot the square value of the field uh, at the exit plane. And in order to compare, they are, it is the same situation with or without the black hole, uh, where we can see how the black hole at first sight, where there is a change of behavior near the, the mirror of the right uh, picture. Uh, so uh, the next step is to, is to put this into a uh, thermal bath where we have many particles uh, coming in uh, of every from every direction, the mm -hmm. particles like the, the right picture, uh, and uh, pushing the mirror with different strength. Then uh, we already have an expression from the uh, total transport, but unfortunately it's going to be left for the future talk. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, the next talk will be given by Federico Manzoni from uh, Roma 3 University, and the title of the talk is Simplexic Central Charges. Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Sergio. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm going to talk about Simplexic Central Charges, and this presentation is based on my work uh, you can find in archive. Here, there is a list of the arguments we will discuss in a while, so geometrical QFTs, uh, Terry Calabiao, simplexis, simplexis procedure, and the conclusion. Um, the next, please. Um, among the possible generalization of ads cft correspondence, we can embed the Dieter brains in a space-time background metric of the form Minkowski 4, that is the word volume of the brains, time um, six real dimensional uh, uh, variety with the structure of a general Calabiao instead of the standard Minkowski 4 times C3. And the point is that uh, choosing uh, in a proper way the geometry of the Calabi-Yau, we are able to construct uh, four-dimensional superconformal QFTs with uh, n equal one supersymmetry and uh, gauge groups, uh, interaction and particle content can be determined essentially by the geometry. And the first examples of this uh, uh, construction is due to Klebanov and Witten. Um, in this series, uh, there is the um, there is a Crucial, uh, there's a parameter, the central, the central charge that plays uh, a crucial role, essentially because it provides a degrees of freedom counting throughout the energy flow, and it appears and therefore controls the conformal anomaly. Uh, the next, please. Um, however, to have more control on the geometry and on the theory, we consider only a specific subclass of Calabi-Yau, that is the Tori Calabi-Yau, and uh, a Calabi-Yau historic if, is, uh, if its geometry group contain at least U1 to the third power. And uh, um, all the geometrical information about this particular class of Calabi-Yau is summarized in a simple object in a two-dimensional diagram that we call toric diagram. 
And uh, um, if you're interested in uh, more about toric geometry or toric labiau, you can find it in this uh, review of uh, Closet. And um, the point is that from this uh, toric diagram, you're able to construct the central charge uh, using a procedure due to boot in Zaffaroni. And however, uh, this procedure is uh, expensive for the computational point of view. And um, in some cases, it's uh, quite tricky. So uh, the next, please. So uh, I propose a new equivalent procedure uh, based on uh, the decomposition of the toric diagram uh, into two simplexes. Here there is an example, and you can use this uh, the red point to decompose the toric diagram into uh, two simplexes. And the true location of these two, this red point will be fixed by maximizing the central charge A that for this specific example takes the expression uh, uh, below. And uh, the first term, the sum, um, is, a is essentially the area, the total area of the diagram, while uh, the other uh, pieces are constructing using uh, this determinant, you can see, and uh, uh, the aj are just uh, uh, constructing using uh, the areas of these uh, triangles. So everything is a function of, uh, um, of the areas. And uh, so the next, please. In conclusion, uh, the simplexis procedure turns out to be uh, cheaper than the booted Zaffaroni one, uh, essentially because uh, the computation time for a single AJ is reduced of about one fifth in, um, with respect to the booted Zaffaroni procedure. And uh, um, this procedure gives uh, a direct interpretation of the quantity in terms of the areas uh, that you can use to decompose the, the areas of the triangles you can use to decompose the torque diagram. And uh, however, there are also open doors about this and uh, we can try to generalize this procedure to higher or lower dimensional cases and uh, also to geometrical construction in M theory instead of string theory. And with the booty Zaffarini procedure, this seems not to be so easy. And uh, uh, from and also we can uh, uh, we would give a diagrammatic uh, procedure to fix the true location of the red point. Um, and we are now working about this. And uh, uh, probably there is a statistical procedure to fix uh, the true location of the red point you can use to decompose the toric diagram. So thanks for the attention, and that's all. Okay, thank you, Federico. Um, our next speaker is Jaydeep Kumar Bazak from the Indian Institute of Technology in Kampur. And he will be speaking about entanglement, negativity islands, and communicating black holes. Yeah. So, hi, everyone. I'm Jaydeep from uh, IIT Kanpur, India. Uh, entanglement, negativity islands, and communicating black holes will be the topic of my talk. Uh, can you go uh, to the fourth slide? Yeah, fourth one. Yeah, I'm not going into the uh, index and all those things because I have only five minutes. So uh, to consider a mixed state, uh, first we start with a system A, which is basically A1 and A2. Uh, it is just uh, at a mixed state row A. In that case, just uh, I can say that internal negativity fails to be a valid measure of uh, entanglement there because it starts receiving contribution from the uh, irrelevant correlation in the question. So in that case, uh, in 2001, Vidal and Werner, they proposed entanglement negativity as a computable measure of entanglement for a bipartite mixed state. And it is uh, defined in this way, which is written in the first equation. Now, this row 82 is basically partially transposed density matrix over one of the subsystems. In this case, you see it is on the second subsystem. To understand that, first take uh, E1 and E2 uh, as two bases in Hilbert space corresponding to A1 and A2 respectively. Then uh, the partial transpose density matrix is given uh, by the second equation, where you can see uh, the color coding where E2J, E2L has been changed their position in the right hand side. One uh, another in interesting uh, feature of this negativity is that it provides the upper bound uh, on distributed entanglement which is basically the amount of entanglement that you can extract uh, from a given uh, mixed state. So can you go to the 10th slide? Uh, 
uh, 10th one. So I am going to the island proposal for negativity before a small recap on uh, island for entanglement entropy. So uh, it was proposed, first proposed in, in these papers, but yes, uh, list is not complete. So we can add 500, 600 papers to make it uh, complete. So the main statement of uh, this proposal is that the fine grain entropy of a region uh, in KFT sector, which is basically coupled to a semi-classical gravity can be given uh, by this equation given below. So the term inside the third bracket that is generalized entanglement entropy, where this ISA, that is the island corresponding to the subsystem A, which was present in the KFT sector. And the second term, uh, the first term has the area of the boundary of this island. And the second term is effective uh, entropy which, uh, of quantum matter field sitting on a union island of A. To understand that, let's take uh, this, uh, this figure where we have both Q of T and A is sitting there, another sector uh, which is emerging from the uh, gravity part, which is uh, denoted by the red part, uh, that is island of A. And having these two, we are going to uh, formulate the generalized entanglement entropy. And then we finally extremize and minimize over the position of the island and we get the final formula for fine grain entropy. So can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so now to define the island for uh, uh, entanglement negativity, uh, I, I should start with the any generalized island formula for entanglement entropy, which was uh, given by Dong et al. and uh, second paper there. Uh, it can be uh, written in, as, as the first equation here, where you can see that N is the uh, parameter of the any entropy there. And following uh, this thing, uh, first, first the development in the first equation, we can have uh, the generalized negativity formula. Uh, let's say for a disjoint subsystems, two disjoint subsystems A and B, uh, that is uh, sitting in the boundary CFT, and C is another interval which is basically sandwiched in between A and B. In that case, uh, the proposal is that the generalized negativity is equal to the half of the special uh, combination of Rene generalized entropy of order half. And when we have the generalized negativity formula, we uh, try to extremize and minimize over Q double prime surface. So uh, this Q double prime surface is the surface which is basically uh, chopping the total entropy islands for A union B into two parts. We are naming them negativity islands A and negativity islands B. And you can understand that uh, as it is depending on the combination we are taking, uh, in the neg generalized negativity formula, it is not going to be the same as entanglement entropy islands. So uh, can I, next. Now having the uh, formula for the uh, disjoint case, we can take always the in-between interval C to very, very small so that we can have the adjacent interval result, uh, which can be written in the first equation. And also for a single interval with little bit of uh, jugglery, we can also have the negativity expression as given in the second equation. I'm not going into the detail. And in general, we can also write uh, the formula for entanglement negativity in island proposal as it's given in the last equation where it is again the sum of uh, two terms. Second term is again effective negativity term. And first term is uh, this back reacted area of this Q double prime surface. Uh, next. Jaydeep, you have one minute. Yeah, so next, next. Okay, so uh, because of the uh, communicating black hole thing, the, uh, we are taking two models basically. The first model is a BCF2 with two boundaries, and we are putting two different uh, boundary condition in the end point. Uh, so uh, we will replace the end points by KR brains uh, going into the ADS3 geometry. And we're uh, considering the finite temperature case. That's why we're uh, taking two copies of BCFT. That's how uh, we're having a, a eternal ADS3 BTZ black hole in the 3D, uh, 3D bulk there. And these uh, KR brains are going to cut my uh, bulks in, in, into this part, what we're seeing in the figure. And we have uh, two induced black hole on left-hand side and right-hand side. Next. Uh, next. Uh, here one can uh, one can have uh, one interval A and we can com compute entanglement entropy there and we can have seven possibilities next which is going to uh, which is going to give us this should be the last uh, one okay so uh, which can be this uh, entanglement entropy uh, page curves there we can have uh, one more uh, phase we can see and okay we can also plot uh, 
with respect to the length of the subsystem and then okay so yes uh, uh and sent okay but uh, we can you, you can check the paper and where we have plotted page curve for negativities and uh, we can also uh, tell you about the modes flowing between these two communicating black holes and their role in entanglement directly so awesome so uh, thank you jaydeep and yeah, thanks our last speaker will be kim lorenz from universidad de barcelona and the title of uh, his talk is Higher Curvature Gravities from Brainworks and the Holographic C theorem. Uh, thank you. I cannot share screen. Can you please uh, enable it? Okay, now. So. Okay, can you, can you see it and the mouse and so on? Yes. And okay. For the counting of five minutes. Perfect. Thank you. So, hello everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm Kim, and my short talk will be based on this homonymous paper, done in collaboration with Dr. Pablo Bueno and my PhD supervisor, Professor Roberto Emparan. So, let's dive straight into the main result of the paper. We found that higher curvature gravitational densities that are induced from brain wall holography fulfill a simple holographic C theorem. As you can see, this result relates three different concepts, which I'll explain separately, and then I'll put together the different pieces to explain what this result means. So the first one, what do we mean by higher curvature gravity? Simply just take GR and add higher derivative operators to it, built from the metric, its Riemann tensor and its covariant derivative to obtain a new theory of gravity that importantly still respects the pheomorphism invariance. And why are people interested in these kind of theories? Well, because from an EFT point of view, the Einstein-Hilbert action should just be the leading term in an effective theory of quantum gravity containing further higher derivative operators. Next, what's brain wall holography? Recall that in standard holography, we have an asymptotically ABS bulk, which is dual to a CFT living on its boundary. Well, in brain wall holography, what we do is we cut our bulk spacetime with a co-dimension one brain, and then discard the part of the spacetime that's behind it, and then we do holography. A word of warning, this is a bottom-up model, so the brain is just purely tensional, it has no other charges. So what do we get? From the bulk point of view, as I've said, we have Einstein gravity in the bulk, but the space-time ends at this end of the world brain. From the boundary point of view, we have what's known as a boundary CFT, but what interests us most is the brain point of view in which we integrate out the bulk, but not the brain, to obtain the following system. A CFT on the asymptotic boundary, and then on the brain, dynamical gravity coupled to a CFT with a UV cutoff. And both systems are connected through transparent boundary conditions here at the, when the brain reaches the boundary. As some of you may have guessed, this dynamical theory of gravity that we get on the brain is not just Einstein gravity, but it's a higher curvature theory of gravity that we can compute by integrating out the bulk using holographic renormalization. We've done that up to order five in curvature, and what we obtain is the following action. And as I've said, recall that this is still coupled to this um, CFT that you've got off. The last piece of the puzzle is a holographic C theorem. What's a holographic C theorem? It's just a statement that ensures that a holographic CFT has a well defined RG flow by constructing a suitable bulk solution that can interpolate between two asymptotic ABS regions, one from the, well, from the ultraviolet to the infrared, and it does so monotonously. And this ensures that the, that the dual CFT is well defined and has a good RG flow. So we have the three pieces that we needed, and we can now understand the main result of the paper. These higher curvature gravities that we have found are not just 
the whole uh, action together, but also the separate pieces uh, fulfill simple holographic C theorems. We believe that this is consistency for uh, this is evidence for consistency of brainwall holographic models. And it also shows that these brain wall constructions can be a, a mechanism to build physically interesting theories of higher curvature gravity, which one might want to explore independently. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much. And be sure to check the paper for details. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Okay, now we have a 30 minutes talk. <laughs>